Merry Kings of Orient La ta 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 By George, it's Christmas Eve again. You know, the one strange thing about being in radio, do you agree, is that it seems that each holiday seems to come so close to the last one. <laughs> you're always doing a Christmas Eve show. You're always doing a show about Thanksgiving. Or you're always just about to record a show or do a show for the 4th of July. It's curious. We three peace. Now, this is Christmas, you know. Absolutely, officially, and irrevocably. Bring it up, if you will, please. All right, all right. Okay, that's enough of that. You know, one good thing about about doing a show. Uh, as alive and as free as a bird on Christmas Eve or any one of the major holidays is that you know darn well that uh, you're almost alone. <laughs> that very few people uh, listen to the radio, and I hope they don't. I mean, I hope everybody has more to do than that. Uh, you know, you know. Speaking of good ideas on on uh, holidays. Have you seen, I think it's Channel 11, isn't it Channel 11, WPIX? That every Christmas Eve, uh, they set up a camera, and all it does is have on the screen, in color, by the way, uh, the fireplace, actually the fire, the whole, the burning Yule log at Gracie Mansion. And they play Christmas music in stereo behind it. Did you see that? It goes on for four hours. In other words, if you live in, <laughs> if you live in an apartment somewhere and you haven't seen in a, a, a fireplace or a burning log since you were nine, you just turn on your colored TV set and there it is. In fact, you know, I, I think modern technology eventually will take care of all that kind of stuff. But you know, they keep singing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. But what's to prevent, uh, uh, them, uh, let's say having a, uh, a television, just, just a film, a scene, on your color TV set of a giant uh, snowstorm. <laughs> you know, you can sit and have your white Christmas, and at the same time, it won't hold up traffic. You know, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I see technology doing all that kind of stuff. But uh, now, you don't mind on a Christmas Eve like this. I mean, you don't mind if we become, frankly, totally and and completely soppily, if I may, uh, go all the way, soppily sentimental. I mean, come on, let's, let's face it, you know, you, you can be hip all the rest of the year. After all, 300 and, uh, 363 days of hipness a year. That's enough, right? And on this one day, you can be on hip. And I think on Christmas, uh, we can afford to be on hip, all of us. After all, it's Macy's biggest day and, and, uh, you know, gimbals flips on Christmas, the whole thing. And then, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of nice that we have a thing like this. And, uh, every night, uh, Christmas Eve like this, uh, you know, one of the curious things about holidays is, uh, I think it's, a, maybe it's one of the reasons holidays exist. Nobody quite knows why people have them, but, uh, maybe one of the reasons why is it gives people a sense of continuity, of, of a, a kind of continuing thing. Um, I remember one of the, one of the most curious Christmas Eves I ever spent. I remember one time in Christmas Eve, and, and this is a, this is part of the business of holidays. People always, almost invariably, begin to talk about, gee, do you remember, what's the craziest Christmas Eve you ever spent? Uh, what's the weirdest uh, New Year's you ever had? And so forth. Well, I'll tell you, one of the one of the most insane Christmas Eves I ever spent, I remember as a little kid, it was a company Christmas Eve. And uh, my, my father at that time worked for Borden Dairy. And... Uh, Borden Dairy used to have this Borden Dairy branch that he worked with and worked for out in Indiana. They used to have every year, they would have this giant Christmas party for all the uh, employees and all the kids. Now, it was different from the office Christmas party. I've, I've attended a couple of Christmas parties in offices that were uh, really exotic. But uh, this is something else, you know. They used to have this uh, big thing out at a, like a country club or something, and everybody would go there, and they'd have Santa Claus and stuff. And the various guys would do things. You know, like uh, um, my father's friend, uh, Zudok, would get up and uh, tell his uh, his uh, Christmas story. Or Harry Gertz, for example. I remember Harry Gertz would get up, and he would... He would uh, 
play Santa Claus every year. He was always Santa Claus, and he would go around and, and give all the Christmas gifts and so forth. But the, this one particular night, I remember, it was, I was just beginning to be old enough to recognize things and, and to recognize stuff as being exotic when it actually happened. Up to a certain point, you don't know these things. But one night, uh, there was a guy got up, and I don't recall who it was. You know, and I found that piece now. A guy got up, and he was dressed in costume, one of the, one of the milkmen. And they had this big Christmas tree. Tremendous Christmas tree, I remember. And all of us were all sitting around, all the kids were on the floor. There must have been about, oh, maybe 300 kids. You know, after all, this is a big board and dairy branch, and all the milkmen all had about 48 kids and everything. So we're all sitting on the floor. And uh, all the parents were sort of in the background, in the darkness all around. It was kind of a big semicircle. I remember the stage very well because, uh, you know, these things impress your, impress your memory when you're a kid. And this tremendous Christmas tree that went all the way to the ceiling. And you could smell the pine needles of this Christmas tree. You could, you could smell uh, the, the, just the whole thing of the tree. It smelled, you know, like outdoors. And it was snowing. It was, of course, this is the Midwest. And it's almost always snowing and cold in the Midwest. And I remember the night before, there had been a big snowstorm and an ice storm. And we were, you know, we were about to go out Christmas shopping. It was the night before Christmas, actually. And uh, I remember looking out through the window of the house with the sleet coming down, fantastic storm. And the wind was blowing. The wind was blowing at maybe 30, 40 miles an hour. And they really get winds out there at this time of the year. It's blowing. That wind is coming in off the lake. And all this sleet was forming on the telephone poles. You saw the telephone poles for blocks around everything. The trees, the sidewalks, everything was covered with this white glowing film of ice. And then about 8 o'clock, we were about to go out shopping, as a matter of fact. All the stores were open till 10 that night. I remember it was after supper. Maybe it was 7.30. There was a terrific crash down the street. You just heard this boom, and the ground shook. It was Christmas time, and everybody was uh, a lot of excitement in the air anyway. And I remember running to the front, and there was a tremendous flare, a big uh, blue electrical flare in the sky. And what had happened was that the sleet, this tremendous snow and ice that was coming down, had formed this thick coating on the high-tension wires. And the high-tension wires had fallen down. Have you ever seen this happening? And it began to sort of multiply. And as far as you could see, uh, I, I remember the streetcar lines coming down about two blocks away. And it was a great big blue flash. And everybody had to stay in the house because they announced on the radio, don't go out because it was very dangerous because of the electricity. And so it was that kind of strange Christmas with the, with the wind and the sleet and the hail. And, of course, that all added to the excitement of it. And so the next night, when we all went to this Christmas party, which we all looked forward to, I went, you know, it's funny how when people talk about Christmas time, they always talk about, you know, family gatherings and all. But not many people ever talk about the, well, you, I guess what could be called the communal or the, uh, perhaps even the corporate Christmas. The thing that happens when everybody gets together and has a Christmas. And they're really, in a sense, strangers. And so we all went out to this, it was a country club. And we'd never gone to country clubs. My father was not the country club type, and that was exotic in itself. We went to a country club outside of town and drove the car, and there was a big parking lot, and the sleet and the slush was coming down, and you could see all the Christmas lights and everything. And I, this was one of the very earliest Christmases I remember as a kid. One of the very earliest. I must have been about maybe, well, I wasn't going to school. I must have roughly been maybe four or possibly at the very outside five. Uh, can you... If, if you're, you know, sitting out there listening now tonight, you know, I don't care how old you are, even if you're only 10 and you're listening, looking back on your life, thinking back on that tunnel of memory, your life seems as long when you're 10 as when you're 100. It, it seems as long. It really does, you know, when you think about it. And and it's just as difficult to remember crucial things at ten as it was as it would be say at a hundred. Now the question I would like to ask, looking back 
over all the Christmases that you can remember spending, what's one of the very earliest ones? Do you really remember actually one of the very earliest Christmases that you spent? Well, this pa- this particular Christmas was one of the very earliest I remember spending. And it was also one of the strangest, really, because of all these blue lights flashing. I remember the the crashing, tremendous crashing when we were driving down there, they had all areas of the town blocked off where you couldn't go near because the wires were down. They were dangerous. And there were blue sparks in the air every time the wind would blow. And there were great big long icicles hanging from everything. In fact, we used to have icicles at that time of the year we had them. We had icicles that went from the eaves of the building of our house. Our house was a, was a frame story house sitting on a lawn that went from the eaves all the way down completely in a sheet, all the way down to the ground. And they were very dangerous. People were always getting killed by falling icicles around there. So we went to this Christmas party this night. They're all excited. See, the kids are all excited. Everybody is all, you know, all really, uh, really ready for this whole thing. And it's going to be a big Christmas party in Santa Claus. And, and they were going to give out Christmas gifts. They always had this tremendous bag of gifts they would give to all the kids. So we're all excited. Well, in the middle of all this thing, again, they had this program. And this is the very first one that I remember, where people who were in the company would do things, like somebody would get up and, like a tall, skinny lady from cost accounting who had taken music lessons since she was nine, would get up and sing, Silent night, holy night. And the, speaking of uh, tall, skinny ladies, uh, this is WOR, friends in New York, Okay, now listen, uh, in answer to a lot of uh, letters that have arrived here, uh, asking about it, I don't know, I don't know quite what to say, but uh, I'll, I'll just lay it out for what it's worth. I do have a new LP out, and a lot of people have written me, and, and one guy in particular said that he heard about it, and he wanted to know all the story, so here is the story. It's a new LP. It's the first LP I've turned out since, oh, 1963 or four when I turned out a few on, on another label. And this is called The Declassified Gene Shepherd. Uh, and it's uh, subtitled, uh, The Public Has a Right to Know. And by God, they do. Absolutely. And it's in stereo. You put this thing on your stereo, and on one side you can hear me playing a Jews harp, and on the other side hitting my head, and on the middle side I'm dancing a jig. So that's The Declassified Gene Shepherd, and it is on Mercury. You can get it in any record shop. I know for a fact that uh, Sam Goody uh, has just reordered. And, uh, in fact, any major record shop, I don't want to plug anyone particular, uh, you'll find them at Abraham and Strauss. Wherever you buy records, you tell them you want Mercury, number SRM, SRM, this is a serial number, SRM1-615, the declassified Gene Shepard. The public has a right to know. Well, before we get uh, too deeply involved in the trivia of life, uh, I'd like to bring up something real important, like uh, flying plastic birds. (laughs) Uh, We've been getting all kinds of calls from people about these wild birds, and they are flying. They really do. uh, They're guaranteed to fly, and they fly about 600 feet, and they're operated with with a rubber band. But what they are, what makes them really fascinating, is that they're genuinely an ornithopter which means that it really does fly like a bird with a with the flapping of the wings. And for a long time, people have been trying to do a thing like this, and it actually works. It's a wild-looking thing. And they look like uh, the drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. They're based on the same drawings. They're orange and yellow and brown and very pretty. They're 16-inch wingspan. And if you'd like to order one, just send your check or money order. They cost three ninety eight each. Send check or money order. To Flying Birds, Department S, Post Office Box 1909, Grand Central Station, New York, New York, 10017. I'll repeat the address, so don't call us. If you miss it, you'll have to listen again. It's Flying Birds, Department S, Post Office Box 1909, Grand Central Station, New York, New York. Okay, 398, check or money order. And by the way, uh, speaking of sending money, we'd like to uh, point out to you that the WOR Christmas Fund is still swinging. And if you haven't uh, contributed to this excellent charity, what it does is buy gifts for kids that are in hospitals in the New York area. Send your check or money order, whatever you'd care to send, to 
WOR Children's Christmas Fund. And the address is Box 710, which is cleverly our frequency. Box 710, Times Square Station, New York. All right, now, if you'll... uh if you'll give me a little of that uh, guitar music, I'll call for it now. I'll give you the cue on this thing. Yeah, we'll set up the mood here. And I, you know that I looked for a long time. I looked for years. Not really seriously, but I was always kind of curious about this thing. And about four years ago, I came across it. What, what did I come across? Well, the first time that I was ever actually involved in something dramatic... And it was connected with Christmas. I remember sitting down on the floor with a lot of other kids. My kid brother is sitting there, you know, and he's already whining because he figures he's not going to get what he wants for Christmas and all that stuff. And my old man has batted him around about five times to keep him him from yelling. And now here we are with all these kids. And we're in this this country club with uh, Japanese lanterns with Santa Clauses all over them, hanging from the ceiling with this tremendous Christmas tree in the corner. We were in the ballroom of the uh, country club. And Santa Claus is about to come out in about uh, half an hour, maybe. And now they're having the program. And some lady gets up and sings Silent Night. And uh, another lady gets up and tells the story of, uh, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. There's always somebody that does that. And then one of the strangest things I've ever seen on Christmas happen. Would you please, if you will, please, just to sneak a little of that, the, background music in there, that soft little cheap guitar music. And by the way, I wonder how many people have gotten guitars for Christmas tonight that they'll plunk around on for about three or four days and then never play with again. Because <laughs> they learn how hard it is to play. All right, let's get set that mood there a little bit. We were all sitting around. We were all sitting around in this place, quiet, quiet. It was, everybody was waiting. Some lady had sung a silent night and the kids were starting to whine a little bit. It was hot in this place and you could smell the Christmas tree and, and, uh, it was snowing out and kind of wet and cruddy out. It was just, a, everybody was all here together and they were all really comparatively strangers except to my father, of course, who worked with all of them. And he was off in the distance someplace. So he wasn't even involved. But just me and my kid brother and Zudok's kid, I remember the three of us were all sitting together, when all of a sudden, out of the darkness came one of the milkmen. But he was dressed in, in, in costume. And somebody played the piano. Another person sat down at the piano. And, and I was already, you know, kind of bored. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't care, really. And the piano started to play. And this man stood up in front of the Christmas tree and and looked at us for a long time while the piano was playing. And he was dressed in costume, a kind of a strange costume with a with a bowler hat, a derby. I never seen a derby except in cartoons before. And he had a derby hat and he had on these kid gloves and he had on a cane. Well, with him sitting on a chair, I guess it was his kid had come out, and there's this little kid sitting down there next to the Christmas tree, and he was wearing, you know those long black socks kids used to wear? He was wearing long black socks, and they were all torn, and he had this old torn suit, and he was wearing a cap, you know, the kind of uh, uh, Jackie Coogan type, big Skippy type cap, and he had dirt all over his face. The kid was in costume, so it was an act. And it was the first moment of drama that I had ever seen that really pulled me in. And I want to tell you, it totally converted that Christmas party. He waited for a moment. The, uh, the piano played. And then this man, whoever he was, one of the milkmen, started to speak in a very dramatic voice. A boot black slept in a dry goods box. And the light, they had it all lit. You see this kid now, he's sleeping in a box. It's a sad little box over there under the Christmas tree. This kid is asleep in this box. And this man is talking now. The light faded out on his face, and you could just barely see him, and he's talking. And here's what he said. A boot black slept in a dry goods box. Yes, and it was on Christmas Eve. 
though all alone in his scanty home, in Santa Claus, he did believe. And then the music played, and I'm sitting for it. I can see this kid. He's asleep in a box there, and he's, he's boot black, but he believes in Santa Claus. He slept on rags and straw, then placed his little shoes outside just as he hung his stocking up before his mother died. And I could hear all the kids next to me. And my kid brother sits up now, and here you see this little kid in this box. What a dramatic thing this was. Now listen to this now. They had it lit, you see, with like orange light. You see this little kid taking off these little old terrible shoes he had with the with the uh, soles were hanging off, and he's taking them off, see, and he's putting them outside this packing box. And he says he put his shoes outside his little scanty house just as he had hung his stockings up before his mother died. And then the light got dim, and you could hear the music playing, and the kid went to sleep. And the man went on. He said, the night rolled on. And no Santa Claus claim. No Santa came. But, and then you saw a dark figure go across the stage. But a thief crept soft and low. And he stole away those little shoes that were left standing in the snow. Sad, sad indeed to see the lad standing in the storm, alone, beside the empty dry goods box that served him as a home, and the look of disappointment, Santa Claus did him refuse. But saddest of all was to hear him call, Santa Claus, bring back my shoes. And so in the darkness, this little kid said, Santa Claus, bring back my shoes. Bring back my shoes. And all of us kids are sitting there, you know, oh, good Lord. It was a fantastic moment. But a moment's time had scarcely passed until I was beside the lad. And now this man who's doing the talking with the bowler hat with the kid gloves, he's over there now. He, you can see him talking. He's standing beside the little boy, and the boy's, bring back my shoes. But a moment's time had scarcely passed until I was beside the lad. What makes you weep, my dear boy? I said, have you indeed not got a dad? Oh, no. Kind sir, he said, but with a beseeching look to me. My mother died. My poor mother died a year ago. Papa was lost at sea. I, I started back when I heard this tale, for I was returning home that night. Then I scanned his face. What did I trace? It was the outline of my own. I grasped the box. As I held my child in a father's fond embrace, I could feel that my brain was whirling and the hot tears rolled down my face. On a whale ship I sailed for a six months voyage to sea. I was wrecked and cast on a foreign shore where none could hear from me. Yes, the truth was clear. My wife, so dear from earth, had passed away. I'd played the part with broken heart of Santa Claus that Christmas day. And the little boy was standing then in that scene. I remember him. He's standing and he's holding on to the man's leg. And the man is holding the kid's head and he's looking out at the audience. And I remember all the kids sitting there looking, you know, oh, holy smokes. And then he finished. He said, thank God indeed to find my boy. Although in the storm alone, beside the empty dry goods box, that served him as a home. Yes, I dispelled his disappointment. Santa Claus will not refuse, for your father has come, my own dear son. I will buy you, I will buy you some beautiful new shoes. We were all sitting there. And I remember, I could hear ladies in the background going, <laughs> And I remember this kid standing there holding on to this man's leg. And with that, the man picked the little boy up. You could see the purple glow of the light. And he disappeared off into the darkness. 
and the piano went bum, ba, 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 ba. and the whole crowd roared. Now remember my kid brother, he's sitting low to the floor now. The scene has scared him so much that he's kind of like half down on the floor, like in a little snail shape. You know, he's like all bent over like a snail. He's going, wah, 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 wah. And I said, what's the matter, Randy? He's stopping. Wah, 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 wah. And he won't stop. Well, my mother comes rushing over. She's in the back. She's like, what's the matter? Wah, 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 wah. His mother's dead. Wah, 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 wah. She said, that was just a story. No, no, I saw it. Wah, 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 wah. And it was about nine kids all over the room were crying and their mothers were holding them. It was a fantastic moment at Christmas time. <laughs> now, isn't that a strange Christmas? Now, that, that is, is one of the earliest memories that I have of Christmas. And I remember this moment. I mean, it, 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 it made it absolutely unforgettable. Now, that is true melodrama. Do you agree? <laughs> and, and, uh, and for a long time, I, I never really believed that I, that I actually saw that. It, it always sort of hung in my mind, this thing. Well, it must have been, oh, four or five years ago. I was in an old used bookstore, a lot of old used books and stuff, and I came across, and I, I always get these things. If any of you run across these things and wonder what to do with them, send them to me. I came across a collection of old American ballads, an old, it's a paperback, look, it's all falling apart, and I, I looked through this thing, just sort of listlessly, you know, I, I figured I'd see Casey at the bat, and sure enough, there it was. I couldn't believe it. There it was. You know what that's called? It's called The Boot Black's Christmas. And it was written by somebody called Barney Mullally. I never heard of Barney Mullally. <laughs> Barney Mullally. And listen to uh, what the preface uh, to this little story says. It says, uh, years ago, without the complications of modern life, people were not afraid of the frankly sentimental. Tragedy in the old days was simple and understandable. A broken heart was just exactly that. And tears were not idle tears. Here is one of the heartbreakers. And that was really a heart. And that was, of course, they did it for kind of, you know, to be, it was kind of fun, uh, the way they, the way they did it uh, that night to the, to the adults. I guess it was supposed to be fun. But to the kids, Man, I'm telling you, there isn't a kid alive that does not react to that kind of melodrama. You could put it down, but at the same time, something deep inside of you. Now, uh, there have been a lot of interesting stuff written about Christmas uh, along that line, and it generally revolves around kids. Now, I'm going to give you a real, uh, a real test now, if you think you know modern American literature. Here is a poem that was written by a modern American poet. And curiously enough, it doesn't sound very much at all like his usual work. Now, I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you try to, and, and, and incidentally, before I go off tonight, I'll tell you about another very curious Christmas I spent. I've spent a whole se and you know why I've spent so many odd Christmases? It's not that my life, uh, has been so much different from other people, but you see, when you're in showbiz, and I have been in showbiz since I've been seven, it was 17, uh, when you're in showbiz and you traveled and lived in all kinds of places around the country, after all, I've now worked in 12 radio stations across the country. Uh, I've been in the Army. I was in the Army for three or four years. Uh, you, 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 you tend to spend a lot of major holidays in very exotic situations far from the normal situation that the average person spends his Christmases. The average person probably spends his Christmas at home with his family, which is the way it should be. But the very few people in the theater or in showbiz have ever really been able to do that. And so we, we tend to have had exotic Christmases that go beyond the ones that the average person has spent. Now, I'll give you a test, a literary test tonight. If you're sitting out there, do you want to hear a really charming little Christmas poem? Now, give me a little more of that, uh, that lovely uh, cheap guitar music. We'll set up the mood here. This is called The Boy Who Laughed at Santa Claus. 
Now, you see, the first one you heard is the story of the boy who believed in Santa Claus. And now this is the story of the boy who laughed at Santa Claus. In Baltimore, there lived a boy. He wasn't anybody's joy. Although his name was Jabez Dawes, his character was full of flaws. In school, he never led his classes. He hid old ladies' reading glasses. His mouth was open when he chewed, and elbows to the table glued. He stole the milk of hungry kittens and walked through doors marked no admittance. You know why? He said he acted thus because there wasn't any Santa Claus. Another trick that tickled Jabez was crying boo at little babies. He brushed his teeth, they said in town, sideways instead of up and down. <laughs> Yet people pardoned every sin and viewed his antics with a grin till they were told by Jabez Dawes, quote, There isn't any Santa Claus. Deploring how he did behave, his parents swiftly sought their grave. They, par they hurried through the portals pearly, and Jabez left the funeral early. How do you like that, kid? Like whooping cough, from child to child, he sped to spread the rumor wild. <laughs> sure as my name is Jabez Dawes, there isn't any Santa Claus. Slunk like a weasel or a marten through nursery and kindergarten, whispering low to every tot, there isn't any. No, there's not. The children wept all Christmas Eve. And Chavez, <laughs> he chortled up his sleeve. No infant dared hang up his stocking for fear of Jabez ribald mocking. He sprawled on his untidy bed, fresh malice dancing in his head. When presently, with scalp a-tinkling, Jabez heard a distant jingling. He heard the crunch of sleigh and hoof, crisply alighting on the roof. What good to rise and bar the door? No, a shower of soot was on the floor. What was beheld by Jabez Dawes? The fireplace, full of Santa Claus. Then Jabez fell upon his knees with cries of, Don't! And pretty please! He howled, I don't know where you read it, but somehow I never said it. No, I didn't. Jabez, replied the angry saint. Jabez, it isn't I. It's you who ain't. Although there is Santa Claus, there is Santa Claus. There isn't any Jabez Dawes, said Jabez then with, an, with impotent vim. Oh, yes, there is. Oh, yeah, and I am him. Your magic don't scare me, it don't. And suddenly he found he wasn't. From grimy feet to unkempt locks, Jabez became a jack-in-the-box, an ugly, vastly ghastly jack in Santa Claus's bulging pack. Yeah, just thought you ought to know, kid, if you're getting smart out there. The neighbors heard his mournful squeal. They searched for him, but let's be frank about it, not with zeal. No trace was found of Jabez Dawes, which, incidentally, led to thunderous applause. And people drank a loving cup and went and hung their stockings up. Now remember that. All of you who sneer at Santa Claus, beware the fate of Jabez Dawes, the saucy boy who mocked the saint. Thunder and Blitzen licked off his paint. <laughs> How'd you like that? Did you like that one? Very good. Now, who wrote that? That was a that was a groovy one. Now, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna read another one for you, boy. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a a really a great one. Now, now, who who wrote that? Do you want to read? You know, in 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 days gone by, particularly in the late Victorian period, uh, some of the best. How much time do we have, Lee? 
seven minutes, I may be able to do it. Some of the best Christmas poetry was written in the late Victorian period. And, uh, and it was frankly sentimental, you see, but that's what makes it so great. And this was written by a great writer who had spent much of his life at sea. Bring this one up now. Come on. This is called Christmas at Sea. And, and among writers, he is probably the premier storyteller, a magnificent storyteller of the last hundred years. The sheets were frozen hard. They cut the naked hand. The decks were like a slide where a seaman scarce could stand. The wind was a nor'wester blowing squally off the sea. The cliffs and spouting breakers were the only things a lee. They heard the surf a-roaring before the break of day, but t'was only with the peep of light that we saw how ill we lay. We tumbled every hand on deck, instant her with a shout. We gave her the mainsail topsail and stood by to go about. All day we tacked and tacked between the south head and the north. All day we hauled the frozen sheets and got no further forth. All day as cold as charity and bitter pain and dread for every life and nature we tacked from head to head. We gave the south a wider berth for there the tide race roared. But every tack we made, we brought the north head close aboard. So as we saw the cliffs and the houses and the breakers running high, and the coast guard in his garden with his glass against his eye. Oh, the frost was on the village roofs as white as ocean foam. The good red fires were burning bright in every long shore home. The windows sparkled clear and the chimneys volleyed out. And I vow we snipped the victuals as the vessel went about. The bells upon the church were rung with a mighty jovial cheer. For it's just that I should tell you how of all the days in the year, this day of our adversity was blessed Christmas morn, and the house above the coast guards was the house where I was born. Oh, well, I saw the pleasant room, the pleasant faces there, my mother's silver spectacles, my father's silver hair, and well, I saw the delight like a flight of homely elves go dancing around the china plates that stood upon the shelves and well i knew the talk they had the talk that was of me of the shadow on the household and the sun that went to sea and oh the wicked fool i seemed in every blessed way to be here and hauling frozen ropes on blessed christmas day they lit the high sea light and the dark began to fall all hands to loose top gallant sails i heard the captain call Oh, by the Lord, she's not going to make it, our first mate Jackson cried. She's not going to make it. It's one or the other, Mr. Jackson, the captain replied. She staggered to her bearings, but the sails were new and good, and the ship smelt up to windward just as though she understood. As the winter's light was ending in the entry of the night, yes, we cleared the weary headland and passed below the light. And they heaved a mighty sigh. A mighty breath, every soul on board, but me. And they saw her nose again pointing handsome, out to sea. But all that I could think of in the darkness and the cold was just that I was leaving home, and my folks were growing old. But a strange one. There's a strange twist at the end, doesn't it? You know who wrote that one? Robert Louis Stevenson. You missed that one, didn't you? And the earlier one, who was the earlier one? Ogden Nash. Doesn't sound like Nash. And you know, uh, now we've only got about five minutes, and uh, most of my, isn't that about, about, about roughly five minutes, something like that, four, maybe three, four, something like that. And I, by the way, I hope you're having a good Christmas out there. But... Uh, I remember one Christmas Eve, and I'm just going to throw it out at you. I've been meaning to tell this story. I don't think I've ever told it. One Christmas Eve, I have, this was in the Army, and I had just turned 18. I had been in the Army roughly a year. I went in when I was 17. I just turned 18, and I've been traveling all over the country, and now I found myself in Fort Monmouth, and we were waiting for shipping orders, and over... The shipping orders, and our company was sort of half on alert, and they only let a few people go home for Christmas, and I was not one of them. They gave those of us who were in the Army at Fort Monmouth, each one of us got a two-day pass 
Now, what are you going to do with a two-day, you know, pass? 48-hour pass is what we got. And I had no money at all. It was in the middle of winter, and it was Christmas. And that's why they gave us the pass. And so on this Christmas Eve, we came into New York, and it was one of the very first times I was ever in New York City. I came in with Gasser, and the two of us had so little money, we hitchhiked. I can remember hitchhiking in from uh, Red Bank, New Jersey, you know, coming in over the Garden State Parkway and all that, and finding into New York City. And we finally got a place to stay. We slept in the swimming pool at the Henry Hudson Hotel. And it was Christmas Eve. And man, was it cold and windy. And so uh, we got our place to stay. We got everything all packed up. And we went out on the town to see what we could do. And the one place we went, because we were broke, and it was the only time I was ever there, on a Christmas Eve, was the famous Stage Door Canteen. Have you ever heard of the Stage Door Canteen? Well, it was Christmas Eve. Stage Door Canteen, you know. Isn't it, isn't it, uh, uh, they always show these things so romantic in movies and that. But actually, this is the way it really was. It was Christmas Eve, it was cold and wet, and the wind was blowing. And we asked a cop in Times Square, where is the stage door canteen? And he pointed over to us. It was a little bit west of Times Square. I think it was on 44th, I'm not sure. And we went over to this place. The wind is blowing. It's a little red door on the side of this building. It didn't at all look like the movies. We opened the door, and here's a whole line of GIs waiting to go down into this place. And we fell in line. And we stood in there with our clothes wet, and you could smell the, the, the dampness and the perspiration. And as we moved down the line, they gave each one of us a ticket. And the ticket was good for our food. And now we're down in the main hall. It was down below. It was not a hall. It was like a, a sunken, ca uh, kind of a, a cavern. And it was dark, and somebody was up there singing songs, children's songs. Do you know who it was? I'll never forget this. The singing lady. The singing lady, of all people, entertaining the GIs, singing Christmas songs. And so Gasser said something to me over his shoulder, and I said something to Gasser, and we both sat down at this table with a, with a big, tall, thin GI who had just come back from North Africa. And he was burnt absolutely black. And he was, you know, he was, had this, had the hollow look of a GI who's seen far too much, uh, uh, far too much combat. He sat next to us. And the three of us sat at this table, little tiny table. It was about the size of a, about the size of a ping pong ball with our feet stuck under all of us wearing our uniforms. And we had picked up our food. Each one of us had a, had a sandwich. They gave us tuna salad sandwiches on Christmas Eve. And two, two, uh, donuts and a cup of coffee. And we're sitting there and the singing lady is singing Silent Night. It's an eerie Christmas. Well, like a man came over to our table, a civilian. You know, they had civilian waiters there who were always volunteers and he came over and he had a tray. He says, you guys want uh, any apple cider? I remember he had apple cider. And Gasser says, yeah. He says, you mind if I sit down with you? Guess is no. Go ahead, sit down. So the four of us sat there, and he asked me, "What? What? Are, what? Are, you know, where are you from?" I said, "I'm from Indiana." I was kind of depressed. He said, "Where are you from?" Guess is says California, and he was down himself for some crazy reason. This man, and Guess says, "What do you do?" I mean, you know, you're a civilian. He says, oh, I'm an actor. He says, "Yeah, I'm an actor." He says, uh, "You might have seen a movie. I just had a movie. I had out." I said, what was, what, what movie, you know, I never met an actor before, you know, big time actor here was in New York. I says, what movie, movie? He says, uh, oh, you probably never heard of it. I said, well, what was it? He said, oh, well, it, it hasn't really been released yet. It's called Laura. I said, Laura, what? He said, yeah, it's a mystery story. It's not very good, really. I don't know why he was down that night. And he gave us some more, some more apple cider. And I remember Gas was saying, what's your name? He says, oh, uh, you probably never heard of it. But never hear of it. Dana Andrews. I said, yeah, well, that's right. I never heard of it, but uh, good luck. And off he went. <laughs>